looking at this series through this letter that Peter is wroting, a oh, wroting. Enrico, it's almost like your grammar. We, we struggle with the same thing. <laughs> that uh, Peter wrote to um, Christians, modern day Turkey, they are about to experience great suffering. So they're in the church gathering like us here, and they are uh, receiving this letter from Peter, and he is saying, I want you to be aware that there's suffering on its way. So the entire letter of First Peter is writing, really preparing Christians how to suffer in this world. We live at a time where this kind of letter is not very popular. We choose to have a Christianity that will make us healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. That's the kind of Christianity that is promoted today. And this kind of thing is very unpopular. It is saying to us here that if we are followers of Christ, we will die. And we might die while suffering. So in First Peter chapter 3... Um, Peter is describing to them how to suffer while being a Christian. Now, the suffering he's talking about here is not having a headache or having a flat tire or not having air time. That's not the kind of suffering he's talking about here. The suffering he's talking about here is a righteous suffering. He's talking about those who confess Christ, who are true believers in a wicked world, who choose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, who choose to hold to his word, who choose to obey Christ. Suffering is inevitable. If you're a true believer, you will suffer. Don't think that when you suffer, you're being punished. Because Christ was the most righteous man who ever lived, and he suffered the most. So I want to draw your attention this morning as we continue looking at how Christ suffered in this world. Christ suffered in this world. And I want us to, just if you look at your chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, from verse 13 to verse 17, he's explaining how we ought to suffer as Christians. For instance, we should tell ourselves certain things. Verse 13, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? Even if we suffer and even if we are put to death, we don't really suffer because absent from the body is present with the Lord. I mean, that's a great reality. That's a great truth that you dominate our thinking. Verse 14, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you see, here's the word. He's, he's pulling our attention here. It's not suffering because um, of um, things that we don't have, a headache or a pain or an illness, but this is suffering for righteousness sake. This is suffering for serving Christ, following Christ, associating closely with the Lord Jesus Christ, obeying his word. He says, you are blessed. That's something that we, sh that we should think of, that if we suffer for righteousness sake, we are blessed. He also says, because you are blessed, in the rest of the verse, and do not fear their intimidation. Another way of saying it, do not fear their fear. And do not be troubled. Here's the next thing that we should do, how we should suffer. Um, set, the Christ, set Christ um, apart as Lord in your life. That's what it means. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. What he's saying here, your suffering is the perfect opportunity to testify about Christ. You might not even have the opportunity to open your words, uh, your mouth with words, but as you suffer, it is that 
opportunity to show others that you trust someone greater than them. He might also give you an opportunity to open your mouth. How will that happen when they ask you to give an account of the hope that you have? Look at verse 16. And this word is going to come up again and again and again in this uh, context. While you suffer, keep a good conscience of what is right and wrong. And we're going to look at it today again. It is common for all of us, for our consciences, to bother us when we're in sin. And we are asking, how can I silence this conscience? Well, it can only be silenced if we have an encounter with Christ. We, we know Him. We know our sins have been forgiven. We are accepted by the Savior. But look what he says there in verse 16. Make sure that while you suffer, you keep a good conscience, which means you remain in the faith. You, you keep on trusting Christ. You don't listen to the voices of Satan who wants you to doubt Him in the midst of your suffering. And then he says, so that in the things in which they slander, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. There's a high price to pay for Christians who want to do the will of God. Now, look at verse 18. Now he's going to explain how Christ suffered. For Christ also died for sins, once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. How did Christ approach his suffering? Just think of it, before he, was, he became a man, he was in heaven, he was a spirit. He was with God, he was equal to God, he had all the privileges of God. And what he did, he became a man. Why did Christ become a man? He came to be a sacrifice for Christ also died. In order for him to have died as a man, he needed to become a man. And this means the humiliation of Christ. What did he do? He died for sins. He didn't die so that we may have beautiful stained glass windows and jewelry that we can buy from Stearns or American Swiss or wherever. He died for sins, once for all, a perfect sacrifice for those who will believe, the sins of those who will believe. He was the just one. There was no sin in him. He died for the unjust. He died for sinners. So if you're here this morning and you think, I'm a sinner, you're an that's a good thing to think it. I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner because here it says that he who is not a sinner died for you. That should give you much hope. So that he might bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. The second verse there in verse 19, showing us another point, that Christ, after he died on the cross, he went to make proclamation in a high security prison to spirits that were bound up at the flood. And we looked at the detail of that last week. The proclamation was made after the death of Christ to Satan to show that Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 that says that the sun will crush the head of Satan. Jesus went he didn't preach the gospel to these evil demons. He made a proclamation. I have accomplished victory over you. So here we are comforted that when we suffer, we can know that even if the whole world and the forces of the world is against us and demons are coming for us and Satan wants to destroy us, they are under Christ's authority. Here's the whole thing that I mentioned last week. Uh, the huge error of the deliverance ministry. The huge error of deliverance ministry that can break generational curses or do spiritual warfare. They want to do what Christ did. But he's already done that. 
So if you're a believer and someone tells you you need to go for deliverance, deliverance of ministry, they are lying to you. You know why they're lying? Because they don't know Christ. Christ has already subjected evil. If you are brought out of the kingdom of darkness and you're brought into the kingdom of light, you are not brought with the prayer of a pathetic sinner. No, you're brought by God himself. The Holy Spirit transfers you into the kingdom of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Today we are going to come to verse 20. And this is really the, the triumphant salvation. Let me read the verse for you. He, we read in verse 19 that he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. He's clearly speaking here about salvation. But here's the point in verse 21. Corresponding. He's now making a comparison with what happened in the day of Noah. And he's going to compare the, the saving through the ark. He's going to compare that with Christ. Just as, um, Abra, uh, um, just as Noah had to get into the ark to be saved from destruction. So in order for any person to be saved, they need to get into the new covenant ark, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. That sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? We could just have a little pool here, and everyone gets in the water, and then they are saved. Is that what it's saying? No, it's not saying that. But yet some people believe that that's what the text is saying. We're not saved through baptism. But he's talking about another baps, uh, baptism. So corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to it. And here in verse 22 is another point. He's really talking here about Christ in his triumphant reign. Where he is he now? He's not in a grave. He is in heaven. So let us look at verse 20 and 21, the triumphant salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we read that um, uh, during the times of Noah, during the construction of the ark, that took about, took about 120 years, there was this time of grace. And uh, Peter is referring to this as, as, as God's patience. 120 years, they watched Noah build this, this ark. And uh, what Peter is saying, it was God's patience. And then he's going to explain to us what was, what was happening at that time. But just to summarize this thought for, for you, here it is. Peter is using an Old Testament example Noah, the ark, the flood. And he's using that picture as he's writing to New Testament believers. We can turn it around. Here we have an example of Peter writing to New Testament congregation and referring back to an Old Testament text where he uses the account of God's patience during the day of Noah before sending the flood. Now, Peter saw a comparison between the ark that was built to save Noah and his family and Christ, who saves his people. This is this great salvation. And the salvation that we have is not through a wooden structure, but it's through a living person. Peter is making this connection. Um, and then he says, during that time, God was patient with a corrupt world. 
Now, we've already looked last week at how this world was. He said, he made this summary saying in Genesis 6 verse 3, My spirit shall not strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. That was how long the ark took to build. And that last generation before the flood watched Noah build the ark. That was God's way of demonstrating to these people that there's one righteous man listening to God and obeying him. Now, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, the same Peter writing 1 Peter calls Noah a righteous preacher, a preacher of righteousness. Now, what does that mean? While the earth was so wicked, and Jesus said, before the second coming, this world will be in the same state. And we already see that. But there, God sent a preacher of righteousness. Now, what is a preacher of righteousness? It is a person that has a life that is lived for God, and that is... And his voice is calling people to repent of their sin, to be right with this God. You can imagine um, how bad it must have been that only eight people could be saved. An entire world filled with people, and only eight people were righteous with God. Think of that picture. Try and think how wicked it must have been. In Genesis chapter 7 verse 1, God said to Noah, You alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. Now what has that got to do with us? Well, just as Noah announced that there was judgment going to come, they see him build this construction, he was coming, he was offering a way of deliverance. They would have asked him, why are you doing this? Well, God is going to destroy this earth. And why are they going to destroy this earth? Because man has become wicked. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 says that God looked at man and saw that every thought and intent of his heart was continuously evil. That was the state of that world in which Noah lived. So only those who were right with God entered the ark. Why did they enter it? Because they believed that God was going to save them through the ark. Now this ark in the Old Testament is compared by Peter to Christ. Who is the only name given whereby any person can be saved. No, you cannot be saved in any other way. You cannot be saved through keeping the law. You cannot be saved through having uh, or doing some rituals. You can only be right with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus completely lived, he was the only person who ever lived, who lived the life that God expected of us perfectly. There is no other. He was totally sinless. He lived the life perfectly, and when he died, he was the perfect Lamb of God to die for the sin of the world. It was God's Lamb, and he's the one that takes away the sin of the world. And so Peter is saying to this these churches he is writing to, in order to be right with God, you must be in the New Testament ark, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you will be saved. Now, I've already said this, that Noah was preaching the gospel. Now, it's not in the way that we... We, we do it now. Okay? It was for that specific period of time. Uh, Noah had faith in God. He obeyed God. He followed his instruction. 
God was saying judgment is going to, uh, is going to come. And the people heard this. Now, there are many of you here that might be like the churches that Peter wrote to. You attend, you came in this morning, you are sitting here, and you hear the testimony of Jesus dying for sinners. Perhaps you've never heard that before. Perhaps you just doubt the story. Perhaps you just think, oh, that's a story made up just to make people scared and feel bad so that they may kind of be subdued and live in this life. But here we have the entire scriptures testifying that you can only be right with God if you come to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are some of you that grew up in, in Christian families. And you have a believing dad, and he's telling you about the gospel. And then you say, I'm just going to put it off for a bit more. You know, the fact that you have a father that shows, that speaks to you about the gospel, shows that God, just like he showed grace to these people, is showing grace to you. And if you hear his voice now, you need to come. You might say, no, 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 I just first want to sort this out or that out, and, I, and I'm going to put it off. You are wasting the period of grace. There are many of you that might have heard the gospel through a family member or a saved spouse or here in church or another Christian and then you just put it off for another time. If you continue to do it, you will be destroyed. You will come under God's judgment. The reason God wants you to hear about the gospel and how to be saved is because he desires for all men to be saved. And just like God had a meeting with a woman in John chapter 4, he might have a meeting with some of you here this morning to hear this thing. I can only be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. It might be the last time that hand of grace is extended to you. So while we have this vivid object, object lesson to unbelievers of God's judgment, so Peter was also writing to Christians in the church. People who confess to know him, who's living lives of compromise. Just think of it this morning. God has called you as a mother to be a message of grace for your children. What are you doing with that opportunity? Are you using it? Or are you filling that responsibility with other things that got nothing to do with the calling that you have as a Christian to be that voice of grace in your children's life? This is the kind of thing that brings the judgment. It brings judgment even upon those who confess to know Christ, but they do not submit to his word. They do not obey him. And so this sermon of the ark was preached at a day where there was great evil in this world. But we are living in such a world as well. Here you have a wooden structure. Paul, Peter is using a wooden structure to speak of a heavenly reality. A symbol of spiritual truth. Of salvation that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. How to escape the greatest problem you have in this life. The greatest problem you have in this life is really to be held accountable for those things that you have done. Before a living God. How are, you going to be, how are you going to sort it out? How are you going to rid it out? You can't start living the law now because you've broken it for 70 years. 
And now you think through keeping 10 years of law, you're going to be right with God? What are you going to do with the 70 years of sin that are against you? This is the wonderful message of the Lord Jesus Christ. That those who come to Christ, those who confess their sin, who embrace that his death was for the forgiveness of our sin once for all, enter into the Lord Jesus Christ and experience salvation. He forgives us our sins past, present and future. That is the great message. Your greatest problem is your sin. You need to get rid of your sin. Because if you stand before God with your sin, judgment is going to come. How can we enter into the ark? Look at the word there in that verse. Paul uses, or, or Peter uses the word baptism. Corresponding to this, baptism now saves you. He's giving the answer, but he's giving it in a way that it needs some explanation. He's not talking here about water baptism. We do that once or twice a year. He's speaking here about spiritual baptism. He's talking about uh, the baptism of regeneration. Now, let's just unpack this. Some false doctrines have taken this verse to mean, they say, you see, if you are baptized, water sprinkled on your head, you are saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. Catholics believe that. That a little baby is brought and some water is sprinkled on the head, now they're saved. We can save the whole world like that. That's not what this means. This means you need to be baptized. The word baptized needs to be put under into. And he's talking here about being put into Christ. That is what needs to happen. Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, I'm mentioning New Apostolics as well because God has saved you from it. The Church of Christ, <laughs> just some water? Just some water that we get out of the Val Dam is now going to transfer me into the kingdom of light. That is not what it teaches. I need to have an encounter with God and I really need to be placed in Christ. And we can explain what that means. The word baptized means to immerse, not just in water, but I need to become immersed and part of and I need to be placed into the Lord Jesus Christ as the ark that saves me from the judgment that is coming just think of it for a moment when Noah and his family were in this world they were immersed in an evil culture we, the same with us. This world came increasingly under God's judgment, and it's still under God's judgment. But then, when the flood came, the final judgment came, they went into the ark, and the door was shut. And we, you can go read about that in Genesis chapter 6. So they were protected by the ark. And God preserved them in the midst of judgment. And that is what he will do for every single person in the 21st century that put themselves, that trust in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Judgment is coming. We already see it. It's coming. It's going to come with a full force. And you cannot escape. You cannot outrun it. You cannot hide from it. You can only um, escape it if you find yourself protected by the perfect obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you find yourself protected by His promise that, that says, Your sins are forgiven and I've accepted you as my own. 
He was not referring here, and if you look at the text, he actually explains he's not referring to water baptism, the removal of dirt. What do we do when we're dirty? We get into water. He's not saying it's going to be through a ritual. But he's talking about a spiritual reality when he's used the word baptism. What is it that saves people? What does it mean to be in Christ? Well, I love the way that, that Peter does this because Paul does it in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 as well. Look what he says there. He says it's that you are, uh, he, he talks about the baptism, now he saves you. He's referring about being in Christ, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Your conscience will jump into action if I sit with you and I say, are you right with God? Answer that question. Are you right with God? Why are you right with God? The wrong answer would be, well, I keep the law. I feed the poor. And that's never going to make you right with God. What does your conscience tell you? Can you appear before a holy God that sees all your sin? Can you appear before him? Now here's the point. That very hesitation you have there in your mind, he is saying that those who to be in Christ is an appeal to God to deal with this evil conscience that is a nagging conscience. I, I can't put my head on the cushion at night or pillow at night going to sleep because it's nagging me. I'm not right with God. Your conscience is your best friend. One of your best friends. But your conscience is going to be hardened if you hear this message this morning and you say, I'm just going to put it off after university or after this afternoon's meal or because you, are, you just don't get it. This appeal is something that God brings into our heart, a guilty conscience crying out to God, how can I be right with you? How can I be right with you? Look at the rest of the verse. They appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what the resurrection is? We all know Jesus died. The resurrection is God's stamp of approval on the work that Jesus accomplished on behalf of sinners. He died for your sin. He clothed you with righteousness. And God approves of that. And God will approve of everyone who completely put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who have died for my sin. To bring me to God. To give me a righteousness that is suited so that I may come into the presence of God and not die. A Christian is someone who has been baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ. Have you ever attended a believer's baptism? What happens? Well, there's a water grave. And the pastor will hold the person that confesses Christ and he will put him in a water grave. He will immerse him. He has died he's died to sin and he is now resurrected he when we do that the person is saying i have inwardly experienced dying into the lord jesus christ but being raised from him being being in christ it's not just a little ritual it's all linked to this water grave. I go in, and that must have, will have significant 
results for the person who truly believes. The first thing is that that person will not love sin anymore. Nor will that person see how far they can live from God without offending Him. Let's just go back to Noah, Noah's day. Think of the similarities between being in Christ and being in the ark. They were building for 120 years. And when the day came, they went into, eight people went into the ark. And the door was shut. God shut that door. Okay? At that very moment when they were in the ark, they die to that world. That world is now behind them. They're not going to see that world again. So too those who are in the Lord Jesus Christ is not just a little cheap association with Him. It is we come into Christ and we, we die to the things that we have found so important and the attractions of the world and, and the things that, that we thought made life life. We die to the previous life that we lived in our sin when we enter into Christ. And then, going back to that day, after 40 days and 40 nights and a period of waiting for all the water to dissipate, they came out of the ark and there was a whole new world. It was no longer a kind of tropical hothouse that it used to be, but it was the world that we know today. They entered into a new world. So too, those who are in Christ, those who are in Christ, how, do, how will you know that you are a believer? I've died to the old world. I've entered into... A new, I'm, I'm exiting into a new world. A new world where I live out the calling that God has for me. This means that a true believer will hate their sin and they will put off their sin. They will not continue in it anymore. But they don't just put off sin. They put on righteousness. Which means they put on the things that God says those who are in Christ will put on. The Bible says we are conformed into His likeness. We are becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Is this your life? Are you a believer? Are, are you living out and enjoying the newness of life that Christ has brought? Or are you waiting for judgment? It's not a wet baptism that saves us. It's a dry one. It's the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Resting, seeking Him, seeking to be found in Him. And then living this life that only He can bring us. It is through faith. It's through trusting and believing that Jesus, who was sinless, died for me, the sinner. I didn't do anything. To win his favor or his approval or him dying for me. He died willingly for sinners. I am saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not just a faith that is like poof, fluffy, little faith. It's a working faith. It means now that I'm in Christ, I also turn away from my sin. Because Christ doesn't love sin. Christ died for it. How can I continue to live in that which Christ has died for? So my life must be characterized even when I suffer 
living a life of faith and trust in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ while I'm dying to my sin. I'm not saved through any right, even church membership, water baptism, doesn't save me. But by an appeal to God for a good conscience. Here it refers that I agree on the terms that God has put out there whereby a man will be saved. God has said there is no salvation apart from Christ. God has said that you cannot save yourself through any of your own man-made religion. Anyone who would be saved must first come to God with a desire to obtain a clean conscience and a willingness to meet the needs. Faith in the person of Christ who has done everything necessary for you to be saved and then repentance which is in light of the life of Christ by appealing to God for a good conscience that is a conscience free from that accusation you have at night and during the day and the king, uh, uh, condemnation that is coming by appealing to God for a good conscience the unregenerated will show I'm tired of sin I'm tired of sin dominating my life and I desire and I make this desire known to God to be delivered from the burden of my guilt and the threat of judgment that is coming. Take that to God and tell Him. Lord, I long to be cleansed from my sin. Not just that one sin that doesn't take no for an answer, but my whole being. And I know I can only be right with you through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help me to repent and to believe. I plead for the forgiveness of Christ and the removal of my guilt. Fixing my conscience so that I may live in freedom knowing that I belong to you. Which only comes through trusting in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's laying hold of the sacrifice Christ that that becomes your ark. That becomes your savior. My dear friends, when we talk about salvation, I'm not appealing to your conscience and to your strength to be right with God. God works this in us because if it depended on us, we will never come. We know that there is a God, but we will set up strange gods for ourselves that, that kind of we feel okay with, but it's not the real deal. But God, the Holy Spirit, will come and He will, in a message like this, in a time of grace like this, point you to the real God that saves, which is the Lord Jesus Christ alone. There is no other name through which we can be saved. He's in the business of rescuing sinners. So if you're a sinner here and overwhelmed by your sin, you qualify for this. If you hear this morning and say, I'm not that bad, you do not qualify for it. Plead with God that he will make you a sinner. That he will see your incredible need and hell that is coming your way. It is God himself who brings his people to himself. It is God himself that secures his people for heaven. Which brings us to our last point, and it's a short one. Verse 32. Peter has just explained that it's essential for the believer to be immersed in the Lord Jesus Christ in, all, in order to be saved. And it is this Lord Jesus Christ that is drawing us into him. 
But here he continues, remember this is in the context of suffering, Christ suffering, and when we suffer, our mind should be filled with this because we need that security. Now look what he's going to do next. Now he's going to draw our attention from being in the grave to being at a throne in heaven. Look at this. Verse 22, Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Jesus, when he suffered, he died for sin. That was his humiliation. He went to preach to, to demons. He preached then the gospel to sinners that they are only saved through Christ. And then he was ascend, he ascended into heaven. Where is he now? He's here with us through the Holy Spirit. But there's a there's our Savior is sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. This is very important to remember in the context of suffering. The, the meaning of the word right hand means there's, it's a place of prestige. It's a place of power. Christ is like the right hand of God. Most of us are right-handed. And we do whatever we do. And Christ is that hand of God who is accomplishing and blessing the church, building his church, even empowering this message this morning of a pathetic sinner to come to your heart, to convict you of sin, give you a desire to follow Christ. Where does that come from? It comes from Christ who is the right hand of the Father. The right hand of God is, the, is a place of honor and authority for all eternity. Where did Christ go after he finished his work of redemption, after he died, after he did all those things, after he ascended? He went to heaven to rule. Christ is ruling right now. He can take your life any second. He's above all rule and authority. He's, he's been placed over all creation. It says there in the verse that he'd gone into heaven in reference to Christ's ascension, which Luke describes in the opening chapters of Acts chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. The disciples saw him ascend into heaven. This Jesus was taken away from them into heaven, and it also says he's going to come and he's going to return. What did Jesus do? This is so important. Jesus became a man. And it is a man that entered into heaven. Previously, no man could see God and live. Jesus did the work necessary for man to be saved and then for man to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ into heaven. Hebrews 6 verse 12 says that he entered as a forerunner for believers, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, here's the thing. What is Jesus doing now for Christians? He's continuing to cleanse us. He's continuing pleading before the Father so that we know, may know that we have a high priest who is who has appeased the Father with his own blood and his perfect life, and now he's interceding there for us as a high priest. He's continuing to do that. When you suffer because you follow Christ, you can know this, that Jesus is interceding for you before God the Father. He is he's making intercession. When you are lonely and you are overwhelmed, you might be the only Christian in your family, remind yourself of this, and you're suffering for righteousness' sake. God is talking about me to the Father, and He's talking well on my behalf. Now, He's not talking well for the unbeliever. The unbeliever who have not trusted in Christ doesn't have this hope. He's mentioning me by name. He's speaking good on my behalf. Look at the next portion of that verse. It also says that he has supremacy over angels, authorities, and powers. Angels, they are good angels, they are bad angels. Call them demons. Demons influence people to do evil things. 
But those people also have their own reservoir of evil things. They don't even need the demons to do the bad things. So when we suffer, and we suffer for righteousness sake, and there are authorities, those are the words used here, and powers, and Satan, and demons doing all these things, I can know that Christ is over all of it. He's not going to allow anything and that it will appear as if he's not in control. He's totally in control of the demons. Satan is his Satan. It's his devil. He will use him the way he wants to, and if we have an encounter with him, with the evil one, it is to grow our faith. Just go read the book of Job. Just go and see how Peter, who wrote this letter, was sifted by Satan. And then he came back and he, he grew in his faith and understanding. These are very important things for us to remember when we suffer. God is in the business of protecting his children. So if you refuse to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have that protection. You have to come to Christ. You have to rely and believe his promises that says everyone who believes and relies upon him will be safe in the ark called Christ. Peter's concluding statement in this passage and the chapter emphasizes again the cross and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and that everything, because he was raised as king of this universe, the whole fallen world and fallen angels and things that people can do against us is under his authority. He, if anything bad happens, he gives the right for it to happen. But it is not in a facetious way. It is not in a cruel way. It is so that he may accomplish great things. In the book of Acts, we read that, that Jesus Christ was put to death by the hands of evil men. He was predestined for that by God to... Now, we look, if you just look at what happened, you say, oh, isn't that terrible? Why did Jesus die? To save sinners. Now the whole thing has clarity. Let me conclude. What do you do when you suffer? Do you slander those who don't give you what you want? Do you gossip about the government who is doing this and that? Do you become depressed because your life is just, it is just absolutely miserable? I, I, I can't believe this is happening. You know what's your problem? You don't believe that Christ is sovereign. This verse teaches that he is sovereign over everything. And that he rules and he's even going to use evil in your life. Some of you have gone through very hard experiences. Some of you had physical abuse, sexual abuse. You've had horrible, and it continues to be just an absolute bashing. God does not waste the suffering of his children when we see that God wants to use it for his glory. If you doubt the supremacy of Christ in heaven, there will be all kinds of evil. You'll be miserable, you'll be depressed, you will complain, you will, you will just go on. You will, no one would want to be with you because you are just a miserable person because you think that the entire world revolves around you. No. Christ has subjected all things, people and demons, circumstances, he rules victorious. He reigns. He's the mighty one. He's ruling in triumph.
But for the unbeliever, they can't say that. Don't live like an unbeliever when you are a believer. Christ is sovereign. Christ is also the ark that saved us. May God have mercy as we hear this. Because if we truly believe this, our lives will change. It will, it, we will show another reality. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us the Lord Jesus Christ to be the only Savior. And we've heard the message this morning that Christ came into this world to redeem man from his sin. To restore him to God. That you have called us and you work this in us that we will repent of our sin and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Completely trusting that he has done all the work for us to be right with God. We've also learned this morning that when we suffer we must have this great view that Christ is in control of our suffering and of everything in our environment that we blame for our suffering. Oh, may Christ be exalted. May we crown him with crowns when we suffer. May we bring praise and worship to him when we think we are getting what we don't deserve. Knowing that he is sovereign, we have to arrange our lives under you. Give us the grace.